how's everyone doing this morning? Good, we're here. Everything you can hear, everything fine, all right. Well, here's the fun part about this morning. Some of you woke up and you forgot that Pastor Ben wasn't going to be here. And you're like, oh man, I could have slept in. And, but you're here anyway, right? So thank you for being here. That's good. Um, and so we're here this morning. We're going to share a couple things about what God does. Um, one of the things that's kind of funny, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of have a little bit of ADHD that goes on every so often. I think even have a little OCD. So when I drink Starbucks coffee, like one of the things I do is I, I, you got to line things up, right? If you, if you don't do it, it doesn't taste right. So now that it's all lined up, I'm good. And we'll, we'll kind of get started here this morning. Um, I wanted to share with you something that's been on my heart for a bit, and it's been, it's been about a three-year journey. About three years ago, a little over three years ago, I went through a very dark time um, for about two and a half years before that, got more and more into, wow, just not believing what God says about me. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to kind of share with you this concept of what does it mean to become love? What does it mean to see things the way God sees them? And so here's where we're going to go this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about some things. And for those of you who may kind of wrestle a little bit with ADHD like I do, here's an outline. It's very simple. We're going to actually talk about a couple things right up front. We're going to see a little bit about what Ben has been talking about the last couple of weeks, right, in, in the Vision 2020 series. But then we're going to talk about what do we see, what does God see, and then the final part is, what do we do with what we now see about the truth that we're learning this morning? All right, so it's going to be kind of straightforward, and we're going to go through a couple things here as we get started. Back in the last couple of weeks, Pastor Ben has been talking a lot about getting our vision right. He talks about being able to, to get our eyes up, to elevate our vision. And one of the things he quoted or said in a couple weeks ago was we need to see things from God's point of view and we need to get our heart on what is on his. In other words, we need to start to kind of live from this place of where God says, hey, this is what's important. So we're going to look at that this morning. He also talked last week a little bit about mission and ministry, right? He talked about our ministry is to kind of be plugged in here and, and do things amongst the family and 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 build this church and build our body. But the, the mission side of it is kind of what Ben is doing this morning. He's down in Mexico. He's part of bringing the gospel to other parts of the earth. And that's kind of the mission side of it. But here's my concern. If we don't see ourselves right, if we don't see things from God's point of view, we, we have a tendency to kind of start working at things that maybe aren't built on truth. So we're going to look at some truth this morning, and we're going to talk about what is it that we see. All right, so we're going to start off a little bit here this morning. Scripture is very clear, right? It says the eye is the lamp of the body, All right? So if you read this with me, it says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So I told you about two and a half years ago, three years ago actually, um, I went through a dark period. It, and part of it's because my eyesight wasn't fixed on the things of God. I was not seeing things clearly. My eye was not healthy. If you kind of study this out a little bit, the word healthy actually means single. So if you look in the kind of the original Greek, the concept behind that is you have this ability to be single-minded, single-focused, right? So if I'm looking at this world around me and I have just this wide open view of maybe, maybe this is true, maybe this is true, or maybe I have an idea of, you know, maybe I, I don't see you the way God sees you and I start to judge you based on that. One of the things that, that we have a, a tendency to do is our eyesight gets a little bit off basis and our, and our view of others starts to get off basis and our view of ourselves, right? So what about healthy, a healthy viewpoint? How many of us have honestly can say this morning that we look at ourselves in the mirror and we like what we see? Anybody? How many people can find a million flaws in the mirror in the morning? Yeah, me too. How many, more importantly, how many of you find a million flaws in your fellow man? I'm guilty of that too, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that coming up too. But, but the concept here is 
right now, all of us in this room, we all woke up this morning and we all have something going through our heads and we, we have a way of looking at this world around us that is heavily flawed and in many cases has a, an entire underpinning of some wrong beliefs behind what we see. So we're gonna keep looking at what is it that we see. One is that the lamp is the light, or excuse me, the lamp, or the eye is the lamp of the body. But let's talk about this. Um, how about seeing yourself clearly? What does it mean to see ourselves clearly? Um, in scripture, in Matthew 6, it talks about, um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, right? And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it says, on these two commandments depends the whole law and the prophets. Now let's be honest with you, um, each other for a second. What does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? What, when you think about that phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, there's two things that, that are, are at play there, right? One is, love, we need to love our neighbors. That's people in this congregation, the people outside, it's people we meet every day. We need to love them, but it says love them as you love yourself. How many people love themselves well right now? Like when you wake up in the morning, you're like, I am so glad I'm me. Anybody? No? Or how, or how about this? I'm so glad I'm not them, right? I'm not that person, right? So think about, like, here's what fascinates me. If God is telling us to love others as we love ourselves, then maybe we better start to learn to love ourselves a little bit better first before we start loving others. Because if I'm your neighbor and you come at me and you're like, hey, I'm going to love you the way I love myself, I'm going to be like, hmm, hold on a second. L l how do you love yourself? Do you, do you love yourself well, right? The, the questions are here is um, if your view isn't right, then you're probably going to love me in a really, really dysfunctional way. Yeah? All right. So, so it's important for us to kind of look at how are we viewing ourselves. So part of our problem every day is we wake up and we see things that may not even ever been challenged in the way we view the world. So we're going to look a little bit more at that, but I want to talk about one more thing about how we see ourselves. And I discovered this recently. I was driving down the road. How many people know where the clock tower is down there? Yeah? Um, so if you're going towards the fire station and you're stopped at the clock tower and people want to turn left and you're behind them, typically you can go around them. Unless, like the person that was in front of me that day, <clears throat> was a little farther over and I didn't really appreciate the way they were driving. <laughs> Anybody else have that feeling? Anybody, like when you're behind the wheel of the car? Um, so. I had this thought flash across my mind, and I love the way the Holy Spirit is such a gentle influence in our lives if we let him be. And the thought came to my mind, Jesus wouldn't drive like I do. Can you picture Jesus sitting there in his car, the light turns green, the person's not moving. You see Jesus going, come on, what's wrong with you, right? That's kind of what almost came out of my mouth. The good news is there were no expletives that day, um, which is good. I, but I, I realized, wait a minute, I am failing to see what's going on in the car in front of me. The person in front of me most likely was maybe distracted. Maybe they just weren't paying attention. But does that mean they're any less valuable to God than I am? Or is their schedule any less important than mine, which really wasn't that important because I was just going to the office and I was actually already early anyway. So did it really change my whole day when I saw somebody from a different perspective? All right, so um, this brings kind of to this point, and we're, we're going to look at this a lot more. This is, this is where we're going to spend most of our morning is talking about what is it that God sees? And we're going to look at it from a lot of different perspectives. But before we do that, let me ask a question. How many theology um, armchair quarterbacks do we have in here? Like, you, you know theology, you're good. You're like, I, I know, you know, there's 613 laws in the Old Testament, 10 commandments, right? Anybody know that? Again, I, I love the fact that God actually says, hey, 
there's a whole bunch of laws. We broke it down to 10 commandments. And matter of fact, we even broke it down to two for us with ADHD. It's like it's easier to focus on two things rather than 613, right? If you're a theologian, aren't you glad God didn't create like 666 laws? Because that would really mess with a lot of things, wouldn't it? Right? All right. So, so is Jesus perfect theology? What do you think? He's perfect, yeah. So it has to be. Yeah, I would assume that most likely Jesus got the whole theological thing right. Matter of fact, he broke the book. So, I mean, if you think about it, right, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the whole theology, theology is really about him anyway. The good news is Jesus really is perfect theology. And so what we're going to kind of look at this is we're going to start looking at some lies that may be in our minds this morning, maybe in the way we view people, maybe the way we view ourselves that if we aren't careful and it goes unchecked, we can live an entire life as a Christian and miss a lot of stuff. I'm into this thing. I'm almost 35 years old in Christ. I'm about, I'll be 50 years old this year. I became a Christian at age 15. And here's, here's how the gospel was presented to me. If you die tonight, where are you going to spend eternity? I'm like, I don't want to go there. I might as well raise my hand, go forward, and become a Christian. Now, I have a small problem with that. I don't think that's the full gospel. It's an important, tan it's, a, it's a touchstone. We used it as a tool, right? We used it as a way to help people understand that there is a place other than he here on earth. There's a heaven and a hell. We don't want you to go there. That's important. But sometimes I think we put people in a in a mode of belief that says it's okay to, to come to Christ and still live like the rest of the world. Still judge the world, still you know, cuss at people, still you know, be angry at your spouse, angry at your boss. All of that's, that's, a, that's still, we don't address that, right? A lot of times Christianity has been watered down to this point of it, it, it's fire insurance. It's not a life transformed. It's not becoming love. And so we're going to look at the fact that, that there's some, maybe some subtle lies this morning that we walked in with that hopefully when we're done today, we won't walk out with the same viewpoint. All right? We're going to take a look at it. And so, so here's um, a couple things that, that I think will help us make the, the shift into how God sees things. Do you realize that when God looks at your life right now, sitting here this morning, that he doesn't see what you see? And he doesn't think the way you think. Matter of fact, I'm convinced that he cannot write your story without the crimson ink from the completed work of, cross, of, the, of Christ on the cross, right? Without that pinpoint of God stepping in and going, I'm dealing with this once and for all, right? The question is this, are you a sinner saved by grace? Amen. Yes, but, but it's not just that. Did he die to, to forgive our sins? Yes. yes, but it's not just that. The reality is this, he died because we were lost sons and daughters. He died to get the sin off of us so that we could actually be revealed for what we were created to be. Mm -hmm. And so what's fascinating to me is this, God can't even write the New Testament account accurately without the blood of cross or, or the cross of the blood of the cross excuse me so uh, abraham and sarah got a little bled over there but think about abraham and sarah with me how many people know the story in the old testament right abraham sarah god says hey abraham you're you're old your wife's old too you you guys guess what we're gonna we're gonna build an entire nation out of you we're gonna come in and you know what you guys are gonna have a son and 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 countless, like the number of stars in the sky, sand in the sea, whatever, that's what you're, you're going to be. And what happened in that story, right? Did they just go, yep, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, and Sarah got pregnant, right? And No? no? no. What happened? No? no? Wow. They tried to fix it on their own, right? So then you have Hagar and Ishmael, and the, that's a whole another day story that we can get into. 
But you also had what else? Did, yeah, so what had also happened is God comes back just before he's about to destroy Sodom, right, and Gomorrah, and he says, hey, by this time next year, you will have a son. And what, what happens? What does Sarah do? Sarah laughed, Sarah laughed and lied in five, five seconds, right? <laughs> so she's like, hey, that's not going to happen. And she's laughing, and, and then God's like, why are you laughing? And she's like, well, uh, no, it wasn't me. I wasn't laughing, right? <laughs> so so what, here, but what, is, what does the New Testament say, right? In Romans... It, it, sorry that it got cut off there, but it says basically, um, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. And this is talking about Abraham specifically. Um, in the presence of God, in whom he believed, he gave his life, um, he gave life, he gives life to the de dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed, this is Abraham, against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. And it says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. That's, that, that boggles my mind. Right? God says nothing wavered. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not what the Old Testament recounts, right? What about what about this part? So again, Sarah and Abraham, this is in Hebrews eleven, right? Hebrews eleven, the great faith chapter. We we see all these things where God says, By faith this happened and this happened. Same thing. Um, by faith Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. God sees something way, way different than we see it every single time. So this morning, you're sitting here, and what are you seeing, and what is God seeing, and why, why are we in a different place? Why aren't we lined up with, with the way God sees things? So let's take a look at this. When we stop to think about what God sees versus what we see, let's take a look at the life of Jesus real quick. In Matthew 5, what does he do over and over and over in Matthew 5? He uses one phrase, and we, we call it a reframing process, but he uses one phrase over and over, and he says, you have heard it said, whatever, right? But I say, so sitting here this morning, what have you heard said over and over, even in, sometimes even in these walls, sometimes in, how many people have been Christians for a while? Like a long while, like a long while, right? Like you were here with Noah, no, nobody, okay, not quite that, that was before the cross, right? That was before. <laughs> right, so, so the reality is, a lot of us have been around Christianity, and we've learned a language. We've learned concepts, things that we consider possible truths, but sometimes we, we, we haven't challenged those. I remember my wife and I, um, we took a, um, a reading the Bible class. Now, here's my background, just so some of you might, might appreciate this. I have a biblical studies degree. I went to a college um, in San Diego called Christian Heritage, not much different than, than a um, Bob Jones University type of a setting. Um, got my biblical studies degree, was involved in youth ministry for a while, and had done some stuff with missions, and a lot of, long story short, I grew up around us, right? All of us in this room, I know you guys. I, you guys are my people, right? This is, like, I can look in your eyes and I can know some of the things you're thinking because I've been around it a while. But I'm starting to realize, not three years ago, um, I missed the boat on some things, and my wife and I actually took this Bible reading class uh, with a with a ministry called River Upstate, and they, they're kind of they're, they're fascinating because it, it's it's non denominational. They're not trying to you know say hey join our church. They're they're not affiliated with any church, but this Bible reading class was just absolutely refreshing because I had heard those stories a million times, and all of a sudden he's like, well, what about this perspective? And we walked away from several of those classes, my wife and I did, we were mad. Because I felt like I grew up and, I, and, 
and I'm not complaining per se, but I grew up around other people who have shared the gospel in a way that sometimes I think was their preference and their perspective, and it was out of a place of brokenness and woundedness in their own life that they shared what they thought was the right thing. And that's okay, and, and quite honestly, that's what I'm doing this morning. I'm sharing out of my life and my experience. So the good news is I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong in all your thoughts. I'm not here to you know, badger you and say, hey, you know, you've been, everything you've ever believed is wrong, because that's not true, right? But, but my hope is this, is that we will look at the life of Jesus and we'll look at what, how he responds versus how we would respond in a similar situation and begin to challenge the way we think. That's my goal this morning, right? So let's talk a little bit more about what God sees versus what we see. How about Paul versus Peter? Some of you sitting in this room feel really qualified to do some really good stuff, but God isn't using you there. Why? I don't know. Maybe God has a different plan. Think, think about it this way. Who was Peter? He was Jewish, but he was a fisherman. So basically fishermen were sort of the dropouts of the synagogue. They didn't progress far enough to be considered a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or any of those guys that knew the law well. They just kind of, they went along, they learned enough to kind of get by. And so Peter was a fisherman. What about Paul? He was. He was the, the Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, he even, Paul says in, in, um, in some of his writings, he goes, I had this resume that shows you, man, I could, I could tell the, the religious leaders every bullet point of who Jesus is from top to bottom. I, I could do it. But, but where did God send him? Right? God sends Peter to the Jews. Matter of fact, Peter has a whole bunch of problems going on in the, the first, you know, through the book of Acts where he's trying to not make sure he doesn't eat the wrong thing because did God say eat it? And he's like, no. And, you know, but Peter was left to to be sort of a, a foundational message bringer or a gospel bringer to the Jewish people. But Paul, who would have been, my, if I was like, if I was looking at resumes and I'm like, okay, Peter Fishman, who, yeah, if we're going to have a, a clam bake and we need some extra fish for a big fish fry, Peter's my man, right? But if I need somebody who's going to go to a very highly trained intellectual religious leaders, I'm going to bring pick Paul every day. But, but God didn't, and God doesn't do that even now. So some of us may be sitting in this room feeling like, God, where do I plug in? And you're, you may be leaning on things like, hey, I'm, I feel like I should be doing this because you know, I've been trained to do that. Maybe, maybe that's not what God wants for you right now. Maybe God says, you know what? Why don't you go just maybe, you know, and this is not to say that it's not important, but maybe, maybe you need to teach children for a bit. And take a step back from maybe you maybe you think you can teach all this great stuff which you probably can but what about tr teaching children the joy of what it means to know the Lord that takes some talent but it takes also relying heavily upon the strength of God right <clears throat> so what about you this morning what's going on in your mind in other words how does God's view of you this morning conflict with you your view of yourself what are you thinking this morning that might be different than the way God thinks of you? And here's the most important thing in that. What is truth? Are we in agreement that God's word is true? Right? So much so that some of us are like, it's the, you know, if you're not reading it out of the King James Version, it's not right. Anybody that way, right? But, and some of us are, and that's okay. That's not a problem with that, but... <laughs> but if we're that dogmatic about God's word being so true, then let me ask you a kind of a, a tough question. How come we don't believe it? Like, really don't believe it. Like, we live, we say we do, but what happens the first moment something is different than what we truly believe? Say, for example, you get laid off at work. What is that... What does that do to you? What, is it, what does it do to your identity? Like how many people, uh, and I'll, <laughs> my wife, bless her, she's, um, she watched me go through this. 
I worked for about four years at a, a marketing company that I felt was a dream job. Um, and I spent a lot of time there. I was, I was, you know, going up, I was middle management, getting ready to be a director and man, uh, and something that I didn't even see coming changed all that. And I had to take some time because I got, there was a lot of stuff I had to deal with. I dealt with a lot of anger, betrayal, frustration. I know you guys probably don't relate to any of that, but I had to deal with all that because my identity was so wrapped up in what I did, who I was, right? How many people have put so much time and effort into those things and when it disappears, we're like, what am I going to do now? Who am I? Yeah, who am I? And so my hope this morning is, that we have a few more things to kind of walk through here, but my hope this morning is we begin to really see what God sees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so let, let's take a look at this. <laughs> the only thing that's going to change our perspective, the only thing that's going to transform our lives is what? How many people know about Romans 12 to you? <laughs> right? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind, right? We're going to talk about some practical things of that here in a few minutes. But I want to share something with you about this word, transformed. It's only used twice in Scripture. Once in Romans 12, which we all kind of know, but where else is it used? Sorry, I'm a little too far forward, my bad. It's used in the description of the Mount, of, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration. The Transfiguration story where Jesus was completely revealed for who he really was at that moment. Transformed, we call that, we use the word metamorphosis or metamorphized, right? The thing that's fascinating to me is Jesus was completely transformed before Peter, James, and John, they were with him. And who else showed up? Moses and Elijah, they were both there, right? So how cool is that, that, that this concept of us being transformed by the renewing of our mind has, to me, the same connotation that, that we get completely revealed for who we truly are and who God truly sees us to be, right? So we're going to look at this. Um, it fascinates me this. Here's what Jesus didn't do on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? He didn't get up there, and when Peter and James and John were there, he's like, Go sit down. You know, I'm tired of you guys. You guys have been bugging me all day. I've had it. Go sit over there. I'm going to go talk to Moses and Elijah. We're going to hang out. We're going to have a, we're going to have a little bit of conference here because I'm just done, right? I've given people 5,000 loaves and fishes. I've healed people. They keep coming back for more. I, I hear their thoughts. They're not even thinking about me. They're thinking about their next meal, right? Like some of us in this room are, right? We're thinking about lunch. Chick-fil-A is close today. Sorry. You'll have to go to... Zaxby's. Um, Jesus didn't complain, right? Matter of fact, when, when he's up there, the father says something very amazing. He goes, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Why was he so pleased with Jesus? Was it just because Jesus was his son and, you know, Jesus got it right? Why was he pleased with him? Was he just, you know, did he happen to just kind of reconnect and sort of the transfiguration was Jesus being able to check in, high five God a little bit and go on with his day. Yeah, it was, it was because Jesus was doing everything the Father wanted him to do, but he did it as a man, right? He did it in a way that allows us to kind of get a little glimmer of hope this morning because he didn't do it as God. He didn't do it walking throughout the, the, the whole earth as some supernatural person. Matter of fact, he did it as fully man. And one of the things that fascinates me about Scripture is it says he was tempted in everything that we are, but never sinned. And here's what that means to me. If he was in my car that day, he wouldn't have driven like I did. 
And there's countless other ways we can look at that, right? What about you're at school and that teacher that you don't like, you have to take one more class from? What about your boss? I've had some good bosses. I've had some interesting bosses. And we'll leave it at that, right? How much of our perspective and, and our prayer life, how much of it is, God, I'm so tired this morning. I, why am I, if you don't do anything about my boss, I'm, I don't know if I can make it another day. How many of us have prayed that way, right? How many of us have looked at the day and gone, man, I can't take one more thing today. Let me ask you a question. Did you ever see that in the life of Jesus? What about the night he was betrayed? I heard it put this way, and it, and, and it sticks with me every time I hear it. On the night he was betrayed, he didn't do what you and I did, or would do, right? Is it safe to say that he knew Judas was going to betray him? Did he know that Peter and James and John and all the other disciples would scatter and run? What did he do on the night he was betrayed? He washed their feet. He broke bread. Here's what he didn't do. He didn't look at the elements and go, what am I doing? He didn't, his lip didn't quiver. He didn't be like, you guys, man, I know all of you guys are gonna run. John, get your head off me. You know, he didn't do that, right? He literally served to the very end. He never once complained. He never once, never once out of his mouth was a disparaging word. Never once did he devalue anybody. And here's what fascinates me the most. Have you ever wondered how Jesus prayed? Like we know the, the Lord's Prayer, right? That's actually him trying to instruct us how to pray. That's not his prayer. That's not his prayer life. Throughout scripture, we see Jesus often would get up in the morning and what did he do? He went away to pray by himself. And here's the funny part. It's not really funny per se, but uh-oh, did I get knocked off? Next slide. There it is. There it is. <clears throat> so how did Jesus pray? <clears throat> There's a small part of scripture that, that in Luke, he's looking at Simon and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you, or to, to have you, and to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, and what does it say? But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and that once you have returned or turned again, strengthen the brethren. So even then, even Jesus knowing that Peter's going to deny him three times and fail miserably, Jesus prayed for him and said, mm -mm. I, I know you're going to go through this, Peter. He didn't say, Peter, you're, you're, you're not going to go through this trial. You're not going to not fail. But he said, when, you, when you've turned around, what does turn mean? When you repent, right? For how many of us is repentance kind of a hard thing? Like, we don't want to turn around, right? Some of that is because we, we feel like we have to grovel our way back to God. But sometimes repentance could be just simply going, what was I thinking? Right? And being able to go, what, what is the truth of the situation? And also, you know, over here it says, if it, if it doesn't show up in the life of Jesus, then maybe it shouldn't show up in our lives as well. How many people remember the bracelets that used to be out there that said, what would Jesus do? Right? Well, more importantly, let's kind of think through it. What would not only Jesus do, but what would he say? What would he think? How would he pray? So when you, when you start to get up in the morning and you start to think about your day, take a, a brief moment, stop for a second or two, and go, you know what? Jesus, what do you say about my boss? What do you see in my boss? What do you see in my teacher or my spouse? or What, what is it that I need to look at that would allow me to respond and, and act the way you would. So we talked about some of the lies that go on in our head. And I want to camp here for a little bit, and I want to challenge a little bit of our thoughts. This is where we're going to get into a little bit more of the practical side this morning. Um, and when we close in prayer, there's some things that I want to share with you about 
maybe some perspectives on prayer, some things that might be useful in the way we live this. But here's some common lies that, that all of us probably can recognize on some level, right? First one is, I'll believe it when I see it. How many have heard that? How many have said that, right? I'll believe it when I see it. Is that a true statement? No? What does God's word say? Right? So even if we don't see it, like how many people haven't seen the healing that they've been praying for? Right? Does that mean that God doesn't heal? Does it mean we need to write a book on five reasons why God didn't heal my spouse or heal my husband or heal my whatever, right? Is his word true? If Jesus is perfect theology, here's my challenge. If Jesus walked into that situation, would not that person be made fully whole? Right? Are we, is it safe to say that Jesus healed everybody he came in contact with? No questions asked. Was it based on their faith? Sometimes it was, right? He would say, hey, your faith has made you well, go. But it wasn't a formula. It, he, didn't, he didn't heal everybody the same way. Some people, he made some mud and put it on their eyes, and then they could see. Some people, he just spoke a word, and by the time the people returned home, the person was fully whole. That's what Jesus does, right? So when, when we... When we kind of look at this first lie here of I'll believe it when I see it sometimes we need to be careful that we don't let our experience rise above the word of God if our experience is above God's word there's a there's a challenge there because if something happens that doesn't line up then we're going to we're going to build an additional part of our identity around the fact that God didn't answer the prayer the way we thought he should answer it Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this because I feel like in this room there's probably some people that can relate to this. We have all grown up in a sinful world, correct? And terrible things have been done to some of us in this room at the hands of people who don't know what they're doing. And so some of us, our story inside is we carry this message that I'm not valuable. That somehow I'm damaged because of what somebody else did. If that's you this morning, don't do that. Don't live there. There's no reason to live there. Because the second lie is if people only knew who I was, how many people live that every day? How many people walk around every day and we feel inadequate? We feel like a fraud. We feel like... Gosh, if people saw the real me, they wouldn't like what they see. Matter of fact, I don't like what I see. How many people have said that to themselves, right? Don't play that game. Man, here's the deal. Jesus paid such a high price for all of us in this room. And we've got to stop selling ourselves short. We're not for sale anymore. I'm sorry. Nobody can, nobody can buy you anymore. Jesus paid that price. And here's what I hope we can take away this morning. Your story is not what happened to you. It's not what you did. Like how many people have heard the lie that, you know, you are the grand total of all your thoughts and actions. That's hogwash. It's not. You are the reality of what he says about you. How many of you, last weekend, we just sang the song, I am who you say I am, right? Do we believe that? Come on now. I, I'm, I'm just now, I'm 35 years into this thing, guys, and I'm just now learning this. I wish somebody would have told me that I had immense value to God. And the reality is, we are all fearfully and wonderfully made and the person in the car in front of me is just as much a reflection of God as I am. Maybe even more. And here's the fun part. He paid just the same amount of price for that person as he did for me. And here's the harder part. He paid the same amount for the people that have sinned against us, that have hurt us, that have said or done unimaginable things. 
but that's not our identity and it never sh it should never be ever again because the reality is this our identity starts where the cross finished correct so if we start where he finished then it doesn't matter if I'm five minutes old as a Christian or if I'm 35 years into this my identity doesn't change it He's the same today, yesterday, and forever, right? So he determines my value. He determines who I am. And there's, there's nothing anybody else can say about it, right? So let's look at a couple more lies, and we'll, we'll move on to kind of our final thing here. How about no one ever changes? Anybody ever felt like that was true about themselves? Here's what's interesting to me. Three years ago, I was in a very dark place. Now, I'm not perfect. Nobody is, but my life is, is significantly different than um, I was back then. And it's because there are some deliberate choices I've made every day. And I've chosen to fill my mind with the things of God. And I've chosen to fill my thoughts with his truth about me. And here's the fun part. I live with an amazing woman whose job it is, is to bring truth into the lives of people. And that's awesome to me. That's like, I, I, I'm like, that's a cool thing. You get to tell people what truth is. And I, I can tell you that she would say the same thing, that the people that change the most are the ones that actually realize what the truth is and then believe it and act on it. We've all heard the truth over and over. I guarantee you all of us have heard some of the very things I'm saying this morning, but we haven't let it sit long enough in our mind to get it to change the way we think, right? Last little lie is what you don't know won't hurt you. Anybody hear that one? What does scripture say? People perish for lack of knowledge. Or, you know, Ben showed that a couple weeks ago that we, you know, the, if you don't have a vision, people perish. But if we, if we get knowledge, is it safe to say it stops destruction? Right? So if we are destroyed for the lack of knowledge, why don't we get some knowledge? And that's what I'm hoping this morning is we're sharing some things that will allow us to go, hey, maybe I can start to think a little bit differently. All right. So let me, let me back up, and then we'll, we'll talk about these last couple of thoughts here. We started this morning off realizing that we see all of us a certain way. We have a certain perspective. We wake up every morning, and from the time we wake up till the time we go to bed, and even in our dreams, and even in our nightmares, we think a certain way. We respond a certain way. We live that, that's, that's our life every day. Our brain will not stop. Some of us have insomnia, right? Some of us, you wake up in the middle of the night, you can't go back to bed, and you're spinning, your anxiety levels go up. You start thinking about, oh my gosh, all this stuff. But it's what our thoughts are, not his, right? So we, we shifted from thinking about ourselves and how we view life to let's look at what God says about us. And so I, I guess it's safe to assume that we realize hopefully this morning that God sees something entirely different than I see it. And here's what I want us to do is I want us to do a couple things. I want us to get to know him the right way. How many of us have used God's word just as a, a book of principles. It's not wrong necessarily, but how many of us go, hey, my, I, I need to get this in my life so I can do better. Please don't, don't stop there. That's, that's still good. I mean, that, that's a good thing, but let's take it a little bit deeper and let's stop using his word as just principles to live by, but a manuscript to get to know his heart. More importantly, to, to take the lies and go, God, I'm thinking this right now. What does your word say about this thought? And then let his word be right, raised above that thought 
so that we can actually do that. And here's where it comes down to faith. Faith is hard, right? But it's not if you're like a little kid. And God even tells us, unless your faith is like that of a little child, man, that's, that's, that's huge for us. If we can just simply go, you know what? God's word says it. That's pretty cool. I, I'm, I'm, down, I'm okay with that. And I'm going to live that way based on what he says. And then we, we talked a little bit about this last part here of believing absolute truth. If Jesus is perfect theology and we cannot see half the stuff that's in our life, if we can't see that in him, then maybe it doesn't need to be in our life as well, right? Now, here's the... Here's the, here's the fun part. We don't have to do this alone. Everybody in this room, we have friends. We have people that can pour into our lives, people that can speak truth over us. That's what this um, upcoming Bible study is about love, like you've never been hurt. How many of us have been hurt on some level? And we, we've let that define us. We've let that define our viewpoint. And we've, we've built walls up. And we don't want people to get near us because we don't want to get hurt again. Let's look at, at the fact that we don't have to do this alone. I'm going to close with this. Is the good news is that the Holy Spirit's here. The Holy Spirit is always accessible to all of us. And what does God's Word say? It says that He's the Spirit of truth. So here's the fun part to me. Jesus prays for us. He intercedes for us daily, right? Scripture says that. He's at the right hand of the Father interceding. So Jesus is praying for us. That's pretty cool. And then we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and his role is to lead us into all truth and righteousness. Yeah. And so the, the good part of all this stuff is we don't have to do any of this by ourselves. We have somebody in heaven who is standing by God going, oh, man, that Jeff Baker guy, I like him. And man, I'm going to get him closer to me every day. Holy Spirit, go get him. Challenge that lie that he's thinking right now. Bring something different into his head, right? He does that with each of us in this room. And so the Holy Spirit is here to guide us into all that, and we don't have to do it all on our own. All right? I thank you for letting me share this morning because what I realize is this. This is sacred place up here to share God's truth and God's heart with his people is not something that I take lightly. Um, I'm humbled that, God, that Ben said, hey, would you be willing to share something? And I'm like, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. So I want to invite us to, to close in prayer. If you want to stand, you can. Yes. Jeff, one thing that we've been studying in our Sunday school class, yeah. uh, which was listening to the Bible the way Jesus would do mm -hmm. as a original language, the commandment, love others as yourself, can also be translated, love others who are like yourself. Mm -hmm. So it needs a whole different perspective if you yeah. realize that others are just like you, you're just like them. And, you're, and the commandment is to love them in spite of the fact that you're like them and they're like you, Amen. all created in God's image. I love that. I love that. Like, how many people in this room, that's a great question, a great observation, have thought that, man, God can do anything in anybody's life, but for some reason, I don't think he can do it for me. For some reason, I think maybe maybe I'm different. How many people felt like they're just a little bit different than, than somebody else? Anybody? Here's good news. Since the beginning of time, man has never been able to change the heart of God. And that's why he can change the, the hearts and minds of men. Because he, he knows. He knows how to work with you. He knows if you have ADHD or OCD or anything else, right? But he doesn't define you that, by that at all. He goes, you are my son. You are my daughter. I love you and I'm well pleased. He's not mad at you. Like so <laughs> I, I grew up and I thought God was just waiting for me to fail. And so I would wake up every morning and my whole overwhelming thought was, I just hope I don't blow it today. And guess what? Usually by the end of the day, I blew it on some level. What happens if we wake up tomorrow and we do this instead? We go, God, I thank you that I am your son. I thank you that I'm your daughter. And I get the honor and privilege 
of seeing what you have in store for me today. That sure beats getting up and going, God, I hope I don't blow it, I hope I don't blow it. That's the difference between being sin conscious and son or daughter conscious. If we're son or daughter conscious, we're going to live a lot more righteously by accident, right? Instead of by, by focusing on sin all day long, at some point you're just, our flesh is going to go, yeah, sin is what I want. Versus going, if I'm walking as a son or daughter of God, I'm going to live a way that is absolutely amazing. So, No matter what we've done, he'll yeah. never leave us. Amen. No matter what we've done, he'll never leave us. And then the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah. We wake up in the morning knowing that. Maybe saying it once yeah. over ourselves. The Holy Spirit is here to perform that in us. Amen. It is his work. Yeah, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Colossians 1 says, We are holy, blameless, and above reproach. <clears throat> When was the last time you looked in the mirror and go, man, that's awesome. Look at me. I mean, not look at me like we're not being self-absorbed, but we're going, wait, there's Jesus. He's inside of me. I see him in there, right? So let's let's go that way. All right, let's um, pray. If you want to stand up, you can, but let's pray and just um, thank God for this morning and uh, just go on with our day. God, you are so good. You have given us, your word says, everything pertaining to life and godliness. And this morning, God, I hope that we would walk away with the truth and the reality that we are absolutely valued by you, that there is not one ounce of frustration. You don't wake up, or when we wake up, you don't, you don't turn your back on us. You don't meet with the 24 elders and determine that we're an annoyance to you or an inconvenience to you at all. You delight in spending time with us. So this we, God, as we get up every morning, may we see ourselves the way you see us. May we hear your voice speaking truth into us, and may we take everything that goes in our minds, every thought, and literally take it captive, hold it in our hand before you and inspect it and say, God, is this true about me? And if it's not, give us the grace to let it go and to embrace your truth like never before. We love you. We know you love us. And we worship you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Grace Point Church. To find out more information about Grace Point Church, go to our website at www.gracepointsc.org. You can also connect with us on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. To listen to sermon audio and other content from Grace Point Church, subscribe to the Grace Point Church podcast on all major platforms. As well as subscribe to our YouTube page to watch sermon videos and other video content there as well. If you'd like to tune in on a Sunday morning and watch our, our services live, you can do that on our Facebook page youtube page and also through uh, twitter and periscope for pastor ben hill and grace point church i'm james hicks thank you for tuning in